Good afternoon, everyone. This is Morgan Champion with Florida Sarah. Thank you for joining us for the Navigating State Authorization webinar featuring our national discussion panel that was scheduled for our in-person fall workshop. During the webinar, you will hear from Marshall Hill, Executive Director of NC SARA, Jeannie Yaki Fine, the State Regulatory Services Advisor with Cooley LLP, and Cheryl Dowd, the Director of, State of the State Authorization Network. If you could go ahead and look at the survey question we're going to be sending you regarding how many participants are actually in the room with you, if you could go ahead and answer that for us, we'd greatly appreciate it. So the discussion today will focus on the basics of state authorization, as well as, an important, as important issues relating to professional licensing requirements. You will hear an overview of NC SARA and some updates regarding SARA membership and participation. You will also hear information relating to experiential learning placements and an overview of the federal regulations set to take effect in July of 2018. We will pause briefly during the presentation for questions and we will have a full question and answer session at the end of the presentation. You will have the opportunity to type your questions in the chat boxes and we will answer them accordingly. Also, the presentation is available for download in the resources tab. This presentation is being recorded and you will be provided with the link when it is available. Thank you for your attendance this afternoon and we look forward to our discussion. I'd like to say a quick thank you to the Florida Virtual Campus for partnering with us for the webinar series and to our speakers who have graciously given their time to give us a greater understanding of how we can successfully navigate state authorization. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Cheryl Dowd, who's our first presenter. Thank you very much, Morgan, uh, for that nice introduction and for explaining the format of, of our presentation today. I've put the agenda up there, which just uh, recaptures the information that we're going to share today. This is about the fundamentals of state authorization and related matters. So you'll see we'll progress from basics of state authorization through professional licensure, tracking your students, the state authorization reciprocity agreement, pending and existing federal regulations, and the consequences for failing to comply with state authorization requirements. So when we're talking about the fundamentals of state authorization, you know, it comes to mind, you know, what really drives state authorization? What's the essence? And the essence to me is the activity of an institution that occurs in another state, plain and simple. So you're a Florida institution and you have um, an activity that occurs in another state. And here I provided Ohio. So if that is to happen, then the institution would need to determine if the activity that is occurring in this other state is something that's regulated by that state. So you may ask, well, why is that important? You know, why is, why is state authorization an important issue? Well, it has to do with consumer protection. And as you see here, it's because of the consumer protection police power inherent in the constitutional authority of states. When you talk about something being um, approved in one state or authorized or registered in one state, that does not automatically mean that you are permitted to do that in another state unless there is some sort of reciprocity. So by example, we offer the driver's license situation. You have a driver's license from one state and it would not be valid in another state if there wasn't some sort of interstate reciprocity agreement that provided that your driver's license would be valid nationwide. So similarly, the state authorization reciprocity agreement, which we'll talk about in, in more detail in just a few minutes, that some aspects of interstate activity, of educational activities of an institution, do not require more than the original um, authorization or approval by the home state where the institution is located. So when we're talking about activities, what, what activities does this really mean of the institution? Some people were concerned that state authorization really was only about online learning. But we're actually talking about a variety of activities that an institution may be doing in another state. This is not an exhaustive list. It's uh, simply an example of some of the types of activities that are regulated in other states. We, we see marketing. We see internships. We, and, that, and when I say internships and practica, we're talking about internships and practica that could stem from a face-to-face -face program at an institution, not just an online program that also includes an internship. Um, when, uh, when I see that there, there's a difficulty with, with people hearing, um, Ashley, do you want to address that? 
Yeah, we're taking care of that, Cheryl. Thank you. Okay. Sure. I didn't know if maybe something was wrong on my end, but thank you. No, okay. You're, you're so good. Thank um, you. I'm I'm glad that's the case. Okay. So the so what I was saying here is that there are a variety of activities that could be occurring in another state that are regulated by the other state. Now, is there some kind of commonality there? Well, as you have heard, if you've been listening to any of our state authorization discussions over the last few years, a very common answer when people ask questions about state authorization is, it depends. Uh, uh, you'll, if you were to speak to Jeannie or to Marshall or myself or Russ Poulin, um, and you'll hear that people often will ask us, well, you know, I have an insti my institution is uh, located in the southern part of a state, and there's a river, you know, just south of us. The face-to-face -face, uh, work is happening, you know, here at the institution, but our, our students often cross the river, you know, to go do their internship or clinical placements. And so my first, they, and they want to know, do, do we need authorization for that? They're just going across the river. And uh, my first uh, question back to them is, well, is that another state just across the river? And uh, yes, it is. And I'll say, well, it depends. You're going to need to determine whether that state regulates the activity that is happening. Even though you have a face-to-face -face program on your institution's campus on one side of the river, if you have an activity of that, pro of that going on on the other side, you would need to determine if that state regulates the activity. So when we are talking about which states require authorization, you'll find that there are a number of states that do not regulate online learning in their states, but there are a number that do. But what I am pointing out here is that there are not only states that don't require authorization, but then there are some that for online learning, they will ask for a written exemption. So these four states that are listed, listed here, you would actually be seeking a written exemption. You would have to actively pursue a written exemption from those states. And so um, it's not an authorization, it's an actual exemption that you have sought from those states. And I would distinguish that here from the, there are states here where an institution must get authorization for online courses that occur in those states. And you'll see that this is a list of those states that would require that kind of authorization. You'll note the asterisks, and those are to distinguish a few peculiarities. So, you know, I just mentioned there are four states that you must actively seek an exemption. Those are listed. And then the the double asterisk there um, indicates California. California now does regulate online learning for for profits. So if you are a for profit institution, you would need to seek authorization for online learning in that state. So that's the distinction there. It's for for profits. And then the three asterisks at the bottom are in regard to Nebraska. And this only applies to institutions that are offering associate degree or below that have students in Nebraska. Distinguish that from this list where we're talking about purely online non-degree institutions that must be authorized. Again, a list of states where if you have students in these states, the institution must seek authorization for purely online non uh, for non-degree. And uh, again, you'll see an asterisk there for the three, it's three of those states that you would seek um, a written exemption. And then again, um, the double asterisk refers to California, where we're talking about just four profits. Moving along, we're talking here about professional licensure. We've been talking prior to this slide about authorization um, that is uh, enforced by the higher ed agencies of the states. And so that's institutional state authorization. Separate from that, and I underline the word separate, is in regard to licensure programs. We're talking about the programs at your institution that lead to professional licensure. And in, in those situations, if you have a program that's leading to professional licensure, you would need to determine whether uh, the requirements of your program were, are, are consistent with what is required in that state to be able to sit for licensure in that state. So I'll repeat that again. So if your institution is offering a program that leads professional licensure to students in another state, 
you would need to determine whether your your requirements of your program are also meeting the prerequisites to sit for licensure in the other state. So that is something that's important for the institution to do, in addition to determining institutional authorization. Well, why is that important? Well, the licensure boards of the various states have varying requirements, much like the higher ed agencies. So the licensure board requirements could vary in these examples here. They may have different professional accreditations that may need to be sought. There could be different uh, field experience hours or sites or professional examinations. Additionally, there could be certain states that do not allow initial license um, if it comes from another state or will not approve online programs. And the last thing that um, I wish to uh, talk with you a bit about today has to do with tracking. And for those of you that heard that little bark, I apologize for that because that is the puppy that you see in this picture. And uh, he helps me with tracking. Uh, it, this this uh, material can get rather dry, so I have to say that I had to inject some kind of humor here to talk about um, tracking. I noticed one day, I was walking my dog's name's Piccolo, um, and I noticed that he was uh, pursuing something around my yard, and it dawned on me that he was tracking, and we talk about tracking with state authorization, and I saw the happiness on his face when he came to the tree and he caught something up the tree and he tracked it all the way to the tree, and I thought, that's the kind of face I have when, my, when I was working with my institution and I figured out where all my students were located. So we talk about um, needing to track where our students are. And so in addition to tracking our students, we need to keep a running list of our institution's online program offerings. That's something that we need to work um, program to program across our institution to know what programs are actually being offered out of state. We have to educate our campus. We have to have open communication across our campus so that we have a team to make good decisions to avoid compliance issues. So good communication around the institution is, is definitely important. We need to ensure that our school tracks where geographically our students are located. We need to work with institutional research to create such a report. And we're not talking about where were our students when they first registered for our institution or first were admitted to our institution, but where are our students located when they are completing the activities of the institution. And we should also track where our faculty is teaching our courses because what we sometimes find is with online programs our faculty could be in another state providing uh, the work that they do for teaching the courses and then finally we need to audit our professional program offerings when we talked about professional licensure just a few minutes ago i was talking about you know making sure that we're aware of what is required in the other states for our students to be able to sit for professional licensure so if our program leads professional licensure, we need to know the requirements in that state. And so, and we need to know um, on a continual basis. So not only are we following where our students are located, ensuring that um, we know the prerequisites in that state, but we're also tracking any regulatory updates. And so at this point, uh, Ashley, I believe we have time for a couple of questions. Hey, Cheryl, it's Morgan. Um, we do have a couple of questions that popped up here. One is, what about online programs from nonprofits in California? So you mentioned the for-profits need to be regulated. What about the nonprofits? That's right. Um, at this time, the nonprofits are not regulated in the state of California. So when you saw that list of, um, pro of states that required um, some kind of authorization, California is one that is only regulating the institutions that are for-profit. So if you're a for-profit in Florida and you're offering to students in California, then those for-profit Florida institutions would be seeking authorization. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we have another question. How will SARA impact the need to keep a running list of our online offerings? Uh, well, we'll talk about Sarah in just a few minutes, but as far as tracking and um, keeping a list of our online offerings, it is always important to be able to keep a list of where our students are located and what our programs are that we are offering. Not only are there reporting requirements for Sarah, but just for your institutional benefit, you need to be aware 
of what your programs are at your at the various uh, locations across the United States to determine if there are any additional requirements um, that could be for those states. The next question um, is, is this also for distance ed courses, not just fully online programs? That's correct. State authorization has to do with any type of activity that crosses state lines, so we are not just talking about online courses. Okay, great. Uh, next question, how are schools tracking the location of their students during a given semester? That's a very good question, and we're seeing a variety of ways that institutions are doing that. Some of them are creating their own programs with their institutional research to um, work with the registrar's office and re institutional research offices so that they are asking that question at registration each semester. And uh, you can find the um, at, with the state authorization network, um, we're pleased that annually we provide a state authorization network award called the Sensational Award. And uh, so we um, will acknowledge people with, with their good innovation to create ways to track students um, and share that with uh, the network, um, network members. But it's something that you would need to work with registrar and institutional research to develop a plan to be able to seek uh, location. Great, that's very helpful. Here's the next question. We'll just take these last two that I have right now and then we'll move on to Marshall's portion. Um, is the authorization based on the student's home state or where the student is located when taking an online course or completing an internship? That's a very good question because it does get very confusing. But you as a Florida institution, if you are not a member of SARA and you wish to um, have students in Alabama, you would need to determine what the requirements are in Alabama for authorization to be able to offer activities, whether it be an online course or completing an internship. You would make that determination. But it would be you are seeking permission, if you will, of the other state to offer your activity in their state. Okay, um, are we looking at just where the students are located when trying to get licensed or do we also consider their place of legal residence? That's a very good question as well. And what, you're, what you are trying to seek at this point is uh, what, what are the prerequisites where they are located? And, and yes, we have had, this could get into a very long and deep discussion, and I'm sure Jeannie could offer um, a lot of good insight into this as well, because what we see is sometimes people are transient, so where they're located may not be where they actually intend to sit for licensure. But um, many, many folks are taking their, their programs in the location where they will be seeking a license. So that's why you are looking to see what are the prerequisites in the location where the student is to determine if what you're providing is um, meeting the requirements to sit for licensure in that state. Great, thank you, Cheryl. And uh, we'll go ahead and pause the questioning for now. People can ask him um, you know, at the end or if Marshall wants to take a break after his answer, then we can do that as well. But we'll go ahead and move on to, to Marshall's portion. Okay. So, SARA is the State Authorization Reciprocity Agreement. SARA was developed to help states and institutions deal with all of this complexity and variety that Cheryl has been discussing up to this point. You can readily see how difficult it must be to deal with 54 states, territories, and districts, find out the rules, uh, laws, regulations that each has, and then ensure that you're doing what you need to do as an institution to legally uh, enroll students from those uh, states. So Sarah had a number of initial goals. We decided early on to work through a state-level reciprocity system. So reciprocity is that concept which allows us to have a driver's license in one state but drive in all others because our states have agreed to recognize uh, the uh, driver's licenses awarded by other states. So SARA is an agreement between member states. It's not an agreement between institutions or accreditors, but an agreement between states. 
And the goals were to make this whole process more efficient and effective uh, and uh, better able to deal with quality issues that would arise and lastly, less costly for states and institutions to deal with. Uh, you can readily see that uh, this could become an expensive process, not just for the registration fees, licensing fees, authorization fees that many states charge, but for the need to have fairly significant staff resources at the institution. And those, uh, those fees come from only uh, a couple of places from student tuition or, or state resources and both of those are in short supply. So CERA was developed over a multi-year process of negotiation. Uh, if it had been developed solely by institutions, it would look very different than it now does. And frankly, most uh, regulators would not uh, accept it. Uh, if it had been designed solely by regulators, it would look very different. So what we did was draw people from both extremes of perspective toward some level of agreement in the middle. We also worked with accrediting bodies, with regional compacts, higher education compacts, and there was at one point a national commission on the regulation of post-secondary distance education. We've had dealings with the U.S. Department of Education uh, about SARA. The uh, chief higher ed officials uh, during the Obama uh, terms uh, have been both very supportive of SARA. We haven't heard anything really from the current administration. So SARA is an agreement between states, but it has been and is continuing to be implemented and administered through four regional compacts, which have existed for a long time. These are not the regional accreditors. This is not SACS, not the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, but four existing regional compacts that have been around for a long time. Uh, SREB, of which Florida is a member, is the Southern Regional Education Board. Uh, SREB began in 1948. Witchy, a few years later, NEBI, the New England Board of Higher Education, uh, is about 45 or so years old, and the Midwestern Higher Education is the most recent of the four, but it's still at least, I think, 25 or so years old. So SARA is implemented through these four regional compacts, and most states belong to one of the four regional compacts. Two states, the Dakotas, North and South, Dakota, so believe in the value of the regional compacts that they each belong to both WICHE and MEC. So when the Dakotas joined SARA, they chose whether they would do their SARA work through WICHE, the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education, or through MEC, the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. Uh, at the one extreme are the two Dakotas who greatly believe in the value of membership in a regional compact. At the other extreme, we have three gray states in the Northeast, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, which are not full members of a regional compact. Neither is the District of Columbia, um, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, or the Marianas Islands. So those entities, governmental entities that are not part of a regional compact have had three choices. One, they could ignore all of this, in which case their institutions could not participate in SARA because of the early decision to implement SARA through the regional compacts. Second, they could become a full member of a regional compact. But our thinking was that if they hadn't thought uh, about doing that or determined to do that over the past 50 plus years, they were unlikely to suddenly change their minds and do that. The third choice they have had is to affiliate with a regional compact of their choice in order to participate in only the SARA 
initiative, not other programs and services offered by the regional compacts. And that is what uh, each of those entities has done. New York and New Jersey have affiliated with the New England Board of Higher Education, as Sarah states, Pennsylvania and the District of Columbia and the U.S. Virgin Islands have affiliated with the Southern Regional Education Board, SRAB, and now participate in SARA. Puerto Rico uh, has prepared its application to uh, participate in SARA, but as you know, they've had a lot of other things to deal with lately. So I expect there will be some action on that within the next several months. At the moment, we have 48 member SARA states, 48 states plus the District of Columbia and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, the only two states that are not participating in SARA uh, are Massachusetts and California. Massachusetts is preparing its application now. Puerto Rico has prepared its application. California. Uh, is California and has a great deal of inertia to work through and they will require some legislation as most states have uh, in order to participate in SARA. We have just over 1600 SARA participating institutions and this should have been an earlier slide, sorry for that. Uh, early on people thought that SARA would any benefit the large institutions, but as you can see here, the largest number of our institutions are fewer than 2,500 FTE students. The next largest group, the middle group, 2,500 to 10,000 FTE, and the smallest group, 18% of SARA participating institutions, are greater than uh, 10,000 FTE students. These are total student enrollments, not students enrolled in distance education programs. Early on, people tended to believe uh, or thought that uh, perhaps SARA would most benefit the institutions that are for-profit schools. In terms of our membership, that's certainly not the case. The largest percentage of our SARA institutions are public institutions, 54% uh, as of the 1st of July. 40% of SARA institutions are independent, nonprofit, uh, higher ed institutions. 6% or slightly less are independent, for profit institutions. And we have one tribal college. SARA institutions every year report to our office here at NC SARA their enrollments. And this past May to June, just under 1,500 institutions reported, and they reported almost 1.2 million enrollments throughout the country. That report is available on our web page, uh, which is listed right here. So just to speed through this, SARA is voluntary for states and institutions. A state decides to join if it is uh, uh, Accepted by its regional compact, it then invites its eligible institutions to join uh, and membership for institutions is voluntary as well. Uh, we build on the so-called accountability triad. Within SARA, there's a role for the federal government, big roles for states, and accrediting bodies recognized by the U.S. Department of Ed. So we've got a framework for state-level reciprocity, including a governance structure, as I mentioned before, implementation by the four regional compacts, and then a national council to ensure that we have a nationwide approach to this work rather than four regional approaches. So as I mentioned, a state determines whether it wants to join SARA, it applies, its application is considered by the regional compact, and if it is approved, then it invites institutions. Uh, the main role for states is to deal with 
institutions that wish to join and to be ultimate resolvers of student complaints. The most, one of the most important things for institutions is that once they become a SARA institution, they can offer their courses and programs that meet SARA provisions within other SARA states without paying additional fees or meeting requirements in those other SARA states. So the institutions that can participate in SARA must be degree-granting institutions. That is, they must award at least an associate's degree or above. They need to be a U.S.-based institution. Uh, and they can be of any of these three sectors, public colleges and universities, independent institutions, both nonprofit and for profit. If an institution wants to establish a physical campus in another state, that still must be approved by the other state. And SARA establishes a uniform set of physical presence triggers instead of the many, many, many varieties that states have uh, developed on their own. Some people believed that SARA should not deal at all with any kind of experiential learning, that a single student's footprint in the state should trigger physical presence and therefore the ability of that state to regulate the out-of-state institution. Uh, this has been a challenge for SARA, but we include experiential learning placements for several clear reasons. One, it's been known for decades that students that participate in experiential learning programs stay enrolled in institutions at higher rates, they graduate at higher rates, and they have better learning outcomes than students who don't. So to say that we were going to realize that experiential learning had those benefits but not make them available to students who studied at a distance just seemed inappropriate to us. Second, many states regulate uh, experiential learning placements. And by that, we mean uh, internships, clinical placements, clinical rotations, student teaching, all of those kind of things. As you know, many of those activities are required for some degree programs, especially in allied health, teaching, and other disciplines, uh, and most especially in programs that lead to licensure. So this is a complex area of SARA requirements. Uh, as Cheryl indicated, if you are offering a program in another state and that program leads to the student's ability to sit for professional licensure, in addition to getting your institution authorized to enroll students in that other state, you need to check with the state's licensing entity. And they do their work in very, very different ways, but you're obligated to meet their requirements. SARA provides for that kind of activity, basically, but that doesn't give you a way around meeting, to, meeting the requirements of those other states' professional licensing boards. So SARA basically allows for 10 students per program per site. Nobody has, pretty much has discussed very much the identification of students, but Defining a program has been a challenge for American higher ed for 30 years, and defining a site has been a challenge. We intentionally left some wiggle room around these definitions to hope that people of goodwill will work out issues. So I'm going to stop there, and if we have uh, any questions that relate to Sarah, uh, Morgan, I'd be pleased to respond to them. Thank you, Marshall. We had a couple, but we took care of those because they were things you had already discussed. Um, so I think we're ready to move on to Jeannie's portion. Good. Okay. We are going to talk about uh, the pending distance education rules. And they're set to begin July 1st, 2018, which suddenly is not really that far away. 
And these are the, <laughs> the current version as uh, set by the department uh, last December. And the rules do still make proof of state authorization for online programs as a condition of your eligibility. Now, SARA will suffice for that. So if you are a SARA institution, that covers that. You're not having to show a lot of individual approvals, which is great. Um, but it's also going to impose uh, quite a few new and uh, definitely uh, burdensome requirements with respect to consumer disclosures. There are certainly other components of the proposed or the rules as set now in place for July. However, we're going to concentrate today on the disclosures because if we go over all of them, it would be a session just uh, for itself because it would take a lot of time. Now, it's important um, to note that Regardless of what happens with the federal distance education rules, the state regulations and all of the SARA requirements are still going to be in effect. And you would be surprised at how many times uh, we still hear institutions say, oh gosh, let's hope that these don't happen in July of 2018 because then we don't have to worry about anything. Again, I'll, say, I'll, I'll emphasize that it won't change the state requirements or the SARA requirements regardless of what happens in a few months. However, by this point in time, many of us thought that these regulations would be gone, and they're not. So um, as we talk about some of the things uh, that are required, it's going to be important that you as an institution start addressing them because time is running out at this point. Hey Jeannie, this is Morgan. I'm sorry to interrupt yes. you. Um, would you mind speaking up just a little bit for us? Okay, sure. Thank you so much. All right. Um, you're right. <clears throat> Excuse me, and then let me know if uh, I need more or less. Um, all right. So, right now we're looking at uh, the key requirements, and as I mentioned, we have you have to have the ability to show that you have authorization where you have students and then the disclosures that we're going to go over. So the first part are public disclosures, what you have to let uh, prospective students know. Anyone who's uh, wanting to consider coming to your institution would require these upcoming disclosures. And this, again, is regardless of whether you participate in SARA. So you'll have to disclose all the applicable prerequisites for licensure. Again, this is what a lot of institutions are having the most difficult time wrapping their heads around at this point, because so many institutions have been dealing with state authorization, and outside of Florida, so many institutions have already become SARA institutions, and now that's something you guys are working on. Uh, so now uh, uh, the next big thing is, oh my gosh, we have to work on these disclosures and know where our students are. And if an institution hasn't determined whether its programs are going to meet the applicable state requirements for licensure, then you have to publish a statement to that effect. Now, the caveat to this is that doesn't mean that you can just default to that. Oh, well, we don't know. We'll just say that we don't. It's very important to do the homework and to try to determine what the requirements are going to be. And again, as a SARA institution, that's required anyway. So it's going to be important moving forward, as Cheryl talked about, to track where your students are and to know what those requirements are for any program that you have, whether it's teacher education, nursing, or something else that could lead to a license in a different state, to know what those requirements are. And if you do determine that a program doesn't meet a certain state's requirements, then you have to disclose that fact directly to a prospective student. So you're going to have public disclosures that are out there for everybody to see, and then you're going to have individual disclosures, and we'll talk a little bit more about those moving forward. Institutions also will have to disclose if you've had an adverse action from your accrediting agency, and the key to this, too, is that goes back five years. So anything that's happened in the past five years, you would have to publicly disclose. You would also have to provide information on the student complaint processes in all the states where you have students. Uh, actually, it needs to be everywhere because you could potentially have a student coming in from any state, and that's what we advise institutions to do, cover all 50 states. And this is something that's already been in effect before. Um, you also need to publish the refund policies and comply with those under the laws of any state where you have enrolled students. And this will apply even if you're a SARA institution under these rules. 
uh, for SARA purposes, they look at your home state. But if these new rules do go into effect July 1, 2018, you will have to be able to comply with the <laughs> refund policies in other states, even if you're a SARA institution. So that's definitely uh, an added burden. You will also need to disclose whether the institution is authorized to provide the program in each state where the students are enrolled. Again, SARA will suffice for that. So what is the problem if you don't do that? Well, violations of these proposed rules could result in fines under the Higher Education Opportunity Act, or you could lose Title IV eligibility. So it's certainly something to pay close attention to. Um, now, again, I talked about that there would also be disclosures that would have to go directly to the student. Now, the feds have not been really clear on what they mean by direct, as in how, uh, is an email good enough? Does it have to be a, a letter that goes to them and they have to sign it back? What, you know, the details have not been made really clear. However, there have been numerous questions sent to them. Everyone is waiting back on answers on that. But suffice it to say that for now, you know that somehow you have to let the student know directly uh, whether or not your programs are going to lead to that certification. If there have been any new adverse actions taken, uh, by the state or by your creditor, and if a program actually ceases to meet the requirements in a state when it previously did, you would have to notify that student in writing within 14 days of finding out that your program will no longer qualify a student to sit for a license in a certain state. Now, independent of SARA, or the new federal rules, something that already has existed is federal misrepresentation. So even if uh, these rules would not come about, and even if you are not a SARA institution, federal misrep uh, can apply. And that is misrepresentation that concerns the nature of your institution's programs, and it could be false or erroneous. It doesn't have to be intentional. That could impact the programs um, or the listing of your specialized accreditations, that whether the successful completion of a course would qualify a student to sit for an exam. It also discusses whether the professional or the occupational degree that the institution will confer upon completion of the study has been authorized by the appropriate state ed agency. So if you as an institution would claim that you have the proper authorizations in place and you don't, that is a form of misrep. Now, what can happen if you don't obtain these authorizations? Well, the most common thing that happens is you would receive a cease and desist letter from a state. And the state will then try to work with you to get into a compliance. What usually happens after that? Well, the trend lately has been uh, that states are starting to impose fines on institutions. A lot of states had the ability to do so in the past, but not a lot of states necessarily jumped on that. However, we're seeing a, a trend definitely go uh, toward these fines being issued. And a lot of times you won't hear about it because these uh, settlements will occur between the institution and the state. But I can tell you that recently I've worked with some institutions, uh, one of whom is close to $900,000 in fines with the state of New York. Another institution has been cited uh, by California. Actually, there's more than one institution, several. Uh, they, California used to have fines that allowed them to do $50,000 per uh, incident. However, they've just raised those to $100,000. So there are several institutions right now on the hook for quite a bit of money. So uh, just so you know, these fines are real, and it does happen, and it can happen. So it really is important to pay attention to your disclosures and tracking your students. Um, a lot of times, too, the student will settle out of court with the institution, because what isn't enough is when an institution says, oh, well, here, we'll give you your money back. That usually is not enough if a student cannot get licensed in a state where he or she thought that they could. So oftentimes what happens in the settlement agreement is the institution will refund the money, but they'll also award uh, damages to that uh, student because of the time they spent trying to get that degree that now they can't use where they thought they could. And of course, there's a potential domino effect that it can occur with other states, because certainly state regulators talk to other state regulators. 
and they also inform accreditors when something's not happening properly in, the, in their state, and also the Department of Education will then find out from the accreditor or the state. So uh, eventually everyone talks with everyone. And of course what you don't want is an institution is damaged to your reputation because in this, these days of social media, students certainly share information with each other. And at this point, I think we'll open it back up for questions. Great, thanks Jeannie. That was all really helpful information. Um, I'm gonna start with a couple of these. Um, what does it mean for Sarah to allow 10 students per program for intern site? Can you give us a little information on that? And Marshall, do you wanna take the Sarah questions? Sure. Well, what what that means is that in, that states that have joined SARA agree to allow SARA institutions from other states to place up to 10 students per academic program, per site, without requiring special or targeted um, approval for that. Now remember, that's a provision uh, and it's separate from any requirements that a state licensing agency might have because SARA does not in any way bind state licensing entities to do anything. Great, thanks Marshall. Um, the next question says, as a Florida nonprofit seeking to be a SARA institution, Am I to understand that we do not need to seek authorization from California because we are not a purely online degree institution? Okay, there'd be two parts to that. One is, as a Florida institution um, seeking to be in SARA, first of all, you'll apply to SARA, you'll get approved in SARA, and correct that California at this time is not part of SARA. So then you look at the second part of that, which is, are we doing anything in California that would require us to be authorized. If you are a nonprofit institution and if you only offer degree, I'm sorry, online offerings to California, you do not have to worry about getting separate authorization there. But the second part says because we are not a purely online degree institution. So then the next question would be what else are you doing in California that could require you to be authorized? If you're a public institution, let me see, who are you? I'm not sure what SP College is. Um, if you're a public institution, then California does not have jurisdiction over you anyway. If you are a private nonprofit and you are doing something more than offering online activities in California, then you would need to look at any physical presence triggers that California might have where they would say that they would regulate you. So that would be an independent look into anything else that may bring you into their jurisdiction. But again, if you're only offering online type programs to them, uh, you would not have to worry about separate authorization. Great, thank you. Next question, we currently do not market nor do we offer online programs across state lines. However, we do have students who individually find us from other states or who have moved from another state while continuing enrollment in their online courses. Is it correct to say that institutions are still required to abide by state and federal regulations regarding state authorization in this scenario? Yes. Yes, whether the institution is seeking the student or somehow the student you know, goes out on their own, um, the fact that you're offering courses in certain states will be enough to require authorization there. Different states will look at recruiting differently. That goes back to Cheryl's slide that says it depends. But uh, the fact that you have students taking courses from somewhere uh, other than where your campus is located means that you need to look at what the requirements are where those students are. This is Cheryl. Could I add something to that? Um, what I would add is this is why we were talking about the importance of tracking where your students are when they are participating in the activity. So that means it's not just a matter of where they were located when they were admitted to your institution, but where are they located when they're participating in the activity of your institution. So that's an ongoing responsibility of the institution. 
Great. Thank you, Cheryl, for adding that. Um, how does this apply to field trips across state lines? And I would have Marshall talk about the SARA implication on field trips. SARA participating institutions are allowed to do field trips across state lines. The definition of field trips is uh, it varies from state to state. Look at the SARA manual, and there is a section dealing with those kinds of uh, kinds of questions. And Great. if you're not part of SARA, a state, as Marshall said, will look at it again. It will be an it depends answer. Um, some states will allow minimal contact in their state. Um, they'll just consider it something, quite frankly, they don't want to worry about regulating because usually a field trip is something really quick. Um, it will depend on some states on if you're bringing faculty members into the state with those students, how much contact is happening with the student and the faculty member, how much credit's being given. The states are going to weigh that differently. Many states, however, like I said, are not looking to try to uh, bring you under their jurisdiction for something quick that goes into their state, maybe a trip to the museum in New York City or something. Most states are not worried about that. Uh, that doesn't mean there are not exceptions. But again, I think it's important to look at what all activity is associated with that field trip and is it really a field trip. Uh, one thing that we experience sometimes is that an institution will try to call something something it isn't to try to make it fit. Um, and so make sure that that's really all the activity that you're doing. Thank you for that additional clarification. We have a similar question. I think it's already been asked, but just so there's no confusion, I'm going to ask it again. Um, so going back to California, a nonprofit member of SARA that offers on-ground classes in Florida but only online classes in California does not need to seek California authorization. I'll, Ms. Marshall, I'll, I'll take that one. The, the SARA membership status in regard to California is uh, irrelevant. Because SARA is, uh, because California is not a member of SARA, the fact that an institution may participate in SARA is irrelevant as far as California uh, is concerned. But the other parts of your question are relevant. So if if yours is an institution that is a nonprofit independent institution and offers only online courses in California, you do not need to seek California authorization. Great, thank you. Next question. To confirm, as a SARA institution, we can recruit and market freely with other SARA states. For programs with internships slash practicums, even programs that do not need the licensure, the institution can only have 10 of their students per site. That's mostly true. Uh, under SARA provisions uh, dealing with the 10 students per program per site, uh, that's what SARA will cover. Uh, if a state licensing agency has more restrictive requirements, then those state licensing uh, rules uh, would apply. And as far as recruiting and marketing, uh, like in many things, the golden rule ought to apply here. Yes, technically that's the case, but recruit and market in other states in the same way that you would not object to if others were doing it in your neighborhood. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let's see, here's another one. Did I understand correctly that oh, we might, we're going to keep that one out. If I am contacting advisors outside the state of Florida to inform them of our academic programs, do I need SARA approval? Right. I'm not sure I understand that question, so we'll, we'll skip that one. Uh, the third page of the Florida SARA application requests a link to our complaint system. Can you please clarify this request? And is this referring to a student grievance procedure? I'll actually take that question. Um, 
Yes, this I need a, a link to your complaint procedures that you have posted online, and we would need that to show the council as the appellate body for Florida students. And then as part of your Florida application, I've also requested a PDF copy of your complaint procedures, your student grievance procedures, um, to accompany your application just so I have a record of that to show my council members. Next question for the speakers. Oh, we'll, we'll keep that one off too. Um, if I am attending a health or graduate fair out of state, do I need authorization? I believe that may be relating to recruiters. Well, right, and, and so that will go back to those physical presence triggers that are out there already if you're not a SARA institution. Um, and again, that will vary by state. About 40% of the states will say that you need some type of approval for recruiting, but of those 40%, about half of those states will say, well, if you're coming in just to do a college fair, then we, the state, are not going to worry about that. So again, it, it will matter in some of the states, um, but in others it won't. Now, if you become a center institution, of course, that will be covered. Thank you. Um, I think that we may be getting towards the end of our questions here. Um, anybody participating in the webinar, if you want to go ahead and ask your questions now via the chat box, now is the time. We just had another one pop up. There's a public institution. We typically have a few students per year who go to California for medical rotations. As such, does that mean that under state authorization, we must then follow the California triggers such as on-ground recruitment. Because you're a public institution for the state authorization purposes in California, you're not going to have to worry about that. Now, of course, you will need to deal with whatever's required on the medical school side um, for any authorization that would need to be done with the California Board of Medicine or any other requirement there. But again, because you're a public university, you are not under the jurisdiction of the California BPPE. Great. Um, here's another, another one about the complaint procedures. Does the link to the complaint procedures slash student gr grievance procedures need to be something that is exclusive and dedicated to online learning, or can this be for our general complaint procedures, student grievance procedures that apply to all courses at the institution? We do not have a separate one for online learning at this time. Yes, that's correct. If you would just provide your, um, your grievance procedures that you give to your students upon enrollment, and then just ensure that for SARA students that it designates the council as the appellate body for student complaints. We're just going to wait a couple minutes here to see if other questions pop up. Um, again, participants, this is your time to ask the questions if you have them. I'm not sure what is meant. There are a couple of questions that talks about contacting advisors. I'm not sure, including the last one, if I'm contacting academic advisors, this is Jeannie, sorry, via email, with program-specific information as a means of promoting our academic program, do I need authorization? I'm not sure what you mean by contacting academic advisors. The recruiting and contacts is all about contacting students, not people within your institution. Great, thanks, Jeannie. Um, one more popped up. Sarah covers recruiting at out-of-state ed fairs for both online and on-campus recruiting. Did I understand that correctly? Yes. Because thanks, it's, 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 it's virtually impossible to keep the two separate. Uh, and I'll quickly respond to one other question. Please restate the full names of the existing regional compacts. That's the Midwestern Higher Education Compact, the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education, the Southern Regional Education Board, and the New England Board of Higher Education. You can find out more about those through the NC Sarah website. Great, thank you. We're going to keep waiting just a little bit longer to see if any other questions pop up. Um, there is a question about a link to the recorded session. Yes, we will be working um, to get that to you hopefully maybe later this week at the latest early next week. So yes, there will be a link and I will send that out to my Florida Sarah email group 
and FLVC will also be sending that out to anyone who registered for this webinar. Um, I'm reading a question here. Um, I'm going to answer that at a different time, I think. Um, if you have a question about the complaint procedures, if you would just contact me directly at my email, morgan.champion at fldoe.org, because this is a specific complaint question. Here's another question that just popped up. When, when will the information be available to the institutions for the different states for professional licensure? Wow, that would be great if, if that were the case. Uh, this is something that the institutions will do the research on themselves. Uh, there are a couple of websites to help you get started, and Morgan has links to those that she can send you uh, that will have some, uh, for example, the nursing boards, the, the contact information for them, uh, the teacher licensure boards, contact information for them. But this is research that you as the institution will have to do individually based on your programs. The states, there is not a compendium out there of information on professional licensure. I, I can add a little teeny piece to that. This is Cheryl Dowd with State Authorization Network. For our members, we created a document that we went state to state because what we found was some states have a listing of pro, of licensed um, professions in their state, and we try to uh, collate that state per state. That doesn't mean that it's um, all-inclusive, but it at least is a direction for our members to be able to have um, a, a starting place to try to acquire what programs um, require a license in each state. And they're often hyperlinked then to the board of that state. Um, okay. So that, and. Um, I'll go ahead then and add a plug for Cooley, which is uh, there is comp there are a couple of compendiums. One is for professional nursing programs, and the other is for teacher education programs. Those are both things that I have researched and my team has researched, and we update that frequently. Those cover all 50 states and boards for both those programs, but that is a paid service. So I was just talking about things that were entirely free. Um, but for a paid service, we do have compendiums on the nursing and on the teacher education. So they do exist, but again, you know, they're, they're not free. And for a while, there has been available on the website of the State Higher Education Executive Officers a starting point for making these kinds of investigations. Uh, unfortunately, that information is uh, not up to date. So WCET and uh, NC Sarah are going to be working with SHEO to update that information, to house it somewhere else, and to keep it up to date. We're several months away from reaching that point, but at least there is some hope for the future that uh, that information some information uh, will be available. It's a big challenge to try to, for any entity to say, we are going to keep up to date on all of the professional licensure requirements of all licensed professions in all states. To my, uh, to my uh, knowing, no one is, uh, has tried that. No one is claiming to try that. All right, thank you all for the, those clarification points. Um, does SARA override individual state requirements for physical triggers for other SARA states? I would not use the word override. When, when a state voluntarily chooses to join SARA, it agrees to operate under SARA provisions instead of the provisions that it otherwise has in place and will continue to have in place for non-SARA institutions. So it, it's not an override, but when states join SARA, they know what their current laws say and make a choice to provide an alternate way of um, meeting their concerns. All right, thanks, Marshall. Does SARA cover both mandatory supervised field experiences as well as field experiences taken as an elective or optional course? Yes. 
great. Although we are required to belong to a regional compact, there is nothing in the application process that goes through the applicable compact. Is that correct? Um, there's only one piece at the top that I'm aware of that recognizes that we're Florida as a member of SREB, so that's the box they would check. Do the speakers have anything else to add to that? I think it's important to note that it's the state that belongs to the regional compact, and then the individual institutions will apply to the state. So Florida is a member of SREB, but you as an institution only have to worry then about applying to Florida SARA, and then of course paying your NC SARA dues. But you're not applying to the regional compact yourself. That's exactly it. Great, thank you. If I am a recruiter speaking at a student organizational meeting for the purpose of promoting our academic programs, does SARA authorization cover this type of activity? Yes, if yours is a SARA institution and you are carrying out that activity in a SARA state. If you're doing so currently in Massachusetts or California, uh, you're on your own. All right, well, we need to be ready by July 1st, 2018 for the state licensing. You need to be ready now <laughs> for, for many aspects of this, but for the provisions that, uh, that Jeannie went through in regard to the new rules, yes, the date at which they are set to take effect is July 1st. Now, a number of things could happen between now and then, but the safe, responsible, institutional uh, action in the meantime is to assume that those rules are going to go into effect as indicated and get ready to be able to demonstrate you're compliant with them. Okay, we're waiting for a couple more questions to pop up here, so if anyone else has any further questions, we're going to... Um, take those now. So please go ahead and submit your questions if you do have them. We'll wait a couple more minutes here. All right, I'm not seeing any additional questions, um, so we will go ahead and end the presentation. I just want to again thank our national speakers for their time today and their expertise. We really appreciate it. And if you do have further questions um, after the webinar, please feel free to contact me, Morgan Champion at Mor it's Morgan Champion at flgoe.org. So please just shoot me an email if you have further questions. But thank you for your time today and for participating in this webinar. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.